Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Family Sedan channel. I've got three stories to share with you in this latest Moon Family Sedan room temperature jam. And who wouldn't like the title of this story from the Crypto Basic that is on your screen right now? Pro XRP Attorney explains how this week can become crypto's biggest week ever. And I'll tell you what, even if it weren't crypto's biggest week ever, I'll share with you what he's talking about. It would certainly, I think, be fair to say that it could be uh, X, XRP holders biggest week ever in crypto, at least for most of us. Um, and then there's also this headline from the crypto basic ripple V SEC. Deaton makes strong prediction about judge Torres's ruling on XRP. Uh, yeah. And so in terms of, uh, expectations for the outcome of the lawsuit, I think most of you are aware in a general stance of, of what attorney Deaton expects is going to happen, but there are some interesting particulars that attorney Deaton shared just the other day that I think you'll find interesting as we approach the conclusion of this, this gigantic case, the biggest SEC non-fraud case going back to at least 1946. Uh, and then there's this headline and the content of this is laughable. N not, not because of the crypto media outlet, but just the fact that this is even real life. But here's the headline. CFTC bids against SEC in a new crypto fraud case defines digital assets as commodities. And so what they're talking about is the SEC and the CFTC slugging it out, absolutely battling against each other. It's a turf war and it's completely redonkulous. But before going further, I do want to be clear, I do not have a legal or financial background of any kind. I am not offering legal or financial advice and you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. I'm just an enthusiast who enjoys making YouTube videos about crypto related topics, but just as a hobby and just for fun. All right, so into this first piece. Following Bitcoin's rally to $30,000 and upcoming Ethereum's Shanghai upgrade, attorney John Deaton has highlighted the next important event that could make this week the biggest week ever for crypto. And I'm just gonna go straight to the source here. I don't feel the need to read the entirety of the article. This makes the point right here. This is what they were talking about. Uh, this is a tweet from attorney John Deaton just the other day, and he wrote, Bitcoin over $30,000 today. ETH Shanghai update tomorrow. A great and fantastic ruling from Judge Torres in the Ripple case next could prove to be crypto's biggest week ever. Now, there are a few different ways you could take that. Um, just in terms of important occurrences, yeah, you could argue easily that this is the biggest week in crypto because we're talking about the future of crypto, uh, well, at least in the United States. You could talk in terms of price action. I mean, fine, technically, if you talk about, you know, investing in Bitcoin from day one, like back in 2009, then, okay, in terms of price action, there would have been bigger weeks because in terms of, you know, multiplier effect, there's no way that that can be replicated. Now there's way more money in crypto in general. So it depends on your frame of reference and exactly what you're trying to get at here. But either way, the point is not lost on me, and it's probably not lost on you, that should we get a positive ruling from Judge Torres, which... I think is it is coming. I think that's what's most probable, and it is imminent. It tr it is not too much to say that at this point, we're at we're at uh, you know home stretch here. Uh, should that occur, which I, again, which I think is most likely, it is going to be for potentially for many XRP holders their biggest week in crypto. And it, and it depends for how long have you been in crypto, and just, you know I can't say that's true of everyone. And then also, are you talking about price action, or are you just talking about impact from a historic perspective? If you're talking about from a historic perspective, it's pretty easy to argue this is a gigantic week. If you're talking in terms of price action, that's eh, going to vary. Everybody's in a different position, but uh, yeah. Because I, mean, I don't know. Like, what if this does put uh, push XRP up to a new all-time high? Because we're, for, don't forget, this isn't 2022. If we had the case conclude in 2022, I think you still would have seen a pop for XRP if it were a positive news. But now you're talking about in us being in, at the beginning phases of a bull market in conjunction with, with potentially positive news for XRP, the conclusion of this case, whew, who no, I'm just saying, man. And um, in terms of reasons to anticipate that we should be expecting such positive news, there's additional information from attorney Deaton. Uh, here's a new article from the Crypto Basic, Ripple v. SEC. Deaton makes strong prediction about Judge Torres' ruling on XRP. Attorney John Deaton, the founder of Crypto Law, has made new predictions about the ongoing lawsuit between Ripple and the United States Security and Exchange Commission. In a video posted yesterday by Crypto Law, Attorney Deaton said Judge Annalisa Torres would rule that XRP secondary market sales are not securities. And Attorney Deaton said, quote, I'm confident that the judge will say 
XRP secondary market sales are not in play, that secondary market sales are not securities, that the token itself is not a security, end quote. Yeah, and so I, I hope he's right. I think he's very likely to be correct on that because, you know, in terms of you know, any sort of requirement for the judge to say the, those things non-existent, I mean, case in point, if you look back to the library case, uh, I remember during the remedy portion after library had already lost, one of the things that attorney Deaton requested from the judge is, hey, just state that the library credit token itself, LBC, is not a security. And the judge responded no. And the rationale for that was that uh, he wanted to take more of a, I can't, I can't remember exactly how he ordered, but he wanted to take a, you know, a, a more of a light touch approach, approach and just, you know, or maybe, he might use the word minimal. I think he said he's a minimalist. That's my best recollection is that the judge said that he's a minimalist and it's not necessary to get the ruling that would be favorable, you know, and in terms of, uh, you know, making LBC holders happy. He wanted the lightest touch possible. So I believe he just said he's a minimalist when it comes to this stuff. And so he just said, well, secondary market transactions, uh, you know, that's not what I'm ruling on here. That's, that's not a part of this. And so he made that clear. So that should be, you know, a green light, two thumbs up for LBC moving forward in the United States. That's what it's supposed to do. But it would have been stronger, of course, had he come out and said, yeah, of course, LBC, not a security. But he, he him being a minimalist, he's like, well, I don't have to do that. So here, though, this is the difference. This is where you have attorney Deaton saying that uh, Judge Torres, he, he thinks that he said, again, here's the quote, I'm confident that judge the judge will say XRP secondary market sales are not in, uh, are not in play that secondary market sales are not securities, that the token itself is not a security. So that would be a step further than what the judge did in the uh, in the library case. And now, especially if we get that before any sort of remedies portion, if Ripple loses, that would be even bigger, that the token itself is not a security. Oh, please, yes, let that happen. I want go the extra step. I understand the judge didn't want to do it in the library case, but here in the Ripple case, please, please, dear baby Jesus, just please let this happen because that will add that extra oomph and that'll make it just that much more likely that exchanges in the United States will read less XRP. That would make it that much more clear. Anyway, peace continues. Attorney Deaton expressed confidence about a favorable ruling for XRP due to the more than a dozen Michi briefs filed supporting Ripple. Quote, this is, <clears throat> this is from Deaton again. I say that just because of amicus briefs from XRP holders, Coinbase amicus, Blockchain Association, Chamber of Digital Commerce, Spin the Bits, Tap Jets, Tap Jets, <laughs> that wrong, Tap Jets, uh, which Jets with Flying Sky, Tap Jets, I remit, and a slew of others, end quote. And that's true. And this is another thing that, you know, look, so, in some cases, fine, there are a lot of amicus briefs. This is not a common occurrence. I've gathered that from uh, attorneys within our XRP community. This is not common. And the thing that is unprecedented is, you know, roughly 76,000 <clears throat> XRP holders being represented in this case. There's nothing like that has happened in history. That's a first. We're living through it right now and we're part of the community and we're holding XRP, so very cool stuff. Peace continues. Per Deaton, the ongoing lawsuit has attracted lots of attention from cryptocurrency enthusiasts to the extent that the, the judge would feel, quote, morally obligated to have to address those issues even though she technically doesn't, end quote. Yeah, and that, look, that's what I, that's in line with what I've been articulating very recently. I understand she doesn't have to do that, but look at all of the actions leading up to this. Look at all the pretrial stuff. Look at um, the understanding from the earliest days even of um, <clears throat> increasing the uh, capacity of the phone lines for, um, remember calling in for, for the pretrial hearings? Well, that got jacked up from, it might've been, I can't remember what the low number was initially, it might've even been just like a few dozen or maybe it was a hundred. And then they increased capacity for future hearings up to 4,000 and those got maxed out every single time. And then you have 76,000 XRP holders represented by attorney Deaton. And then you have the judge being like, yeah, I want to see everything. I want to see all the arguments. Uh, amicus briefs, absolutely. Just bring it at me. You know, that, that's a strong indication she understands just how important this is. And so even if it's not technically responsible in terms of what's right from a moral perspective, I get what attorney Deaton is saying. If she doesn't get this right and she doesn't make it clear that XRP is not a security that will damage or destroy businesses. And it is not too much. It, that's literally true. It absolutely will. Peace continues. 
Deaton asserts that Judge Torres will not want to avoid uh, giving a decision on XRP secondary market transactions because she is a great judge. And that's a quote, great judge. And then Deaton said, quote, if she wanted to try to avoid them, I don't think she will because I think we have a great judge and we'll see, end quote. And I think Attorney Deaton's spot on. But in the meantime, we do still have to put up with nonsense jack, I don't want to say jackass, ass jackery, <laughs> jackass, jackassery. <laughs> As jackassery? That's the one. That's the one. Uh, we have to put it with jackassery from the SEC. Well, ass hats at the a lot of ass stuff going on over at the SEC. Uh, those ass hat pricks at the SEC. Um, they are absolutely battling the SEC. It's it's like it's like two alley cats in a turf war. I just had this flashback to a, a Family Guy episode. It's like Peter Griffin and a cat in an alley. <laughs> Some of you might know what I'm talking about. They're just like circle each other. <laughs> It's kind of like that. We got the CFTC and the SEC. One side is full of a bunch of ass hat pricks. That would be the SEC side. And it's just so fascinating to, to see this unfold. So check this out. Because it, it really truly is absurd. And it just the fact that you have these entities duking it out the way that they are, how the hell can you, with a straight face, make a claim that there is clarity regarding crypto in the United States? How the hell can you do that? So again, the headline here, CFTC bids against SEC in a new crypto fraud case defines digital assets as commodities. The CFTC calls Bitcoin, ETH, and USDC, that's stablecoin, a commodities in the latest crypto fraud and misappropriation case. So let's pause and note. Recently, Gensler said everything that's not Bitcoin is a security. He also separately has stated that stablecoins specifically uh, would be included in the category of securities, which is kind of funny because especially if you get to the point where you're going through the Howey test, uh, investment of money with the expectation of profit? Who the hell is investing in a stable coin thinking that it's going to be worth more in the future, hoping that it is? Who is that dumb? Who is that dumb? <sighs> really grinds my gears, folks. Anyway, peace continues. Tug of war continues between the CFTC and SEC concerning which has jurisdiction over cryptocurrencies. The SEC under Chair Gary Gensler continues its action against the crypto industry claiming that all cryptocurrencies except Bitcoin are securities. Meanwhile, CFTC under Rostin Benham reasserts that some cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, ETH, and stablecoins, such as USDC, are commodities. Now, check this out, and this is where it's going to start to get more interesting. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission filed a civil enforcement action against former Deutsche Bank investment banker Rashawn Russell in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York. And I'm not going to read the whole quote because it's on your screen, but most has to do with you know, uh, you know, code under section, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to read all that crap, but it states in part, certain digital assets such as Bitcoin, Ether, and USDC are encompassed in the definition of a commodity under section, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Now, th that flies in the face of what the SEC has articulated right now. And not that they, they haven't even declared Bitcoin to be a commodity. They haven't, they haven't declared it to be a non-security. There is no tech. We just know that that's the stance of the current dictator, Kim jong Gensler, over at the SEC. So we don't even have that, even though he just says that. So, yeah, I guess he's probably not going to go after Bitcoin. But mm, do we even know that for sure? No, not technically. And so here you have on this topic, and, and these are such good points, I had to highlight them. You have Paul Gruel, who is the chief legal officer over at Coinbase. And speaking on this story, he shared the following. Once again, a co-equal federal agency says exactly the opposite of another. At the same time, a second U.S. attorney's office has elected to charge wire fraud, not securities fraud, in a parallel criminal case based on its independent assessment of the underlying asset. The rest of the world has stopped smiling at us. They are now outright laughing. Spot on. Now, again, I wish uh, he would have been saying crap like this uh, bit more vocally over the last couple of years, maybe defending, you know, a Ripple and XRP holders, but it's what it is. I won't go off on a tangent in this video. You know my stance on that. Well, then on top of that, Eric Voorhees, who is the founder of cryptocurrency exchange Shapeshift, Eric Voorhees retweeted that, and he wrote the following. If, F if, if SEC and CFTC can't even agree on ETH and USDC, then how the F, censoring there, is how the F is anyone supposed to analyze the other 1,000 plus weirder and more obscure assets? The law is as clear as Gary Gensler's ethical compass. <laughs> I do love that one. 
So you can see, like, again, anybody who's being intellectually honest can see there is not clarity in the crypto space. There's a bunch of people who want to be good actors and they just want to have legitimate businesses conju- conduct legitimate business and they're getting attacked for it. It's disgusting. And we can all agree, yes, of course, there's bad actors in every industry. Go after them. Throw the book at them. Super duper. You're going to get tons of support for that crap. That's easy. What about the rest? What about the good actors just going after all them? They'll steam them my vegetables, bitch. I'm not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the Moon Family Sedan.